A new documentary is about to hit cinema screens and will also appear on SBS next month, a documentary called The Children in the Pictures. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the directors of this documentary, Akim Dev and Simon Nasht. Welcome to Movie Metropolis. Hi there. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Peter. Great to talk to you both. And uh, this film that deals with uh, the horrendous uh, crimes against children, sex abuse and so on, just horrendous stuff. Um, and, of course, with the Queensland uh, task force uh, that dealt with this. How did the documentary first come about? Well, it starts with Dev, but uh, I think he should tell you that story because it's like most of this, it's quite a story. Yeah, you know, there's this, there is a saying, you know, every good story starts with a good story. Um, I was actually uh, researching uh, <clears throat> a documentary about high-risk re-offenders, so recidivist criminals, people who just go, <clears throat> are on the sort of, you know, hamster wheel of going in and out of jail. And um, during my research, I um, was in a protective custody unit in Long Bay, jail doing interviews and um, a guy came up to me he said he was eligible for parole and I asked him what he was in there for and he said um, offences against children um, that he'd been offending against children since basically he was a teenager um, and had, had been doing it for quite a long period of time over 30 years worth of offending um, and as we got talking, the thing that he said that um, is frightening him is that he can't believe the scale of it at the moment. You know, he comes from the, the era of, um, you know, meeting in parks and, you know, <laughs> exchanging magazines discreetly, the trench coat kind of version of a child sex offender. Um, but he was describing these online networks of, <clears throat> excuse me, tens of thousands of people and <clears throat> on the dark web trading gigabytes and gigabytes, millions and millions of images um, in these communities. And um, I, I had to be honest with you, I was really, really sceptical at the time. Just kind of didn't believe it. But... Um, yeah, continue to do a bit of research into that. Um, found myself on one of the, uh, the main boards on the dark web. And that's when I kind of realised that Australia plays a large part in the, the policing efforts in this crime space. So I reached out to Task Force Argos based in Brisbane. Um, Got in, got in touch with the, the, the commander of the unit, John Rouse, uh, told him about the stuff that I had seen because it was, you know, basically beyond, beyond my comprehension what I'd witnessed. <coughs> Excuse me. And John basically said, look, he was pretty busy at the moment, but he'd come back to me when he'd had a bit more time. Now, over the next three months, in the papers, these boards started closing down. And what I didn't realise is that when I was speaking to John, <coughs> sorry, um, him and his team were actually had actually taken over and were running the boards. So that's where the that's where it all began. That's where our relationship with Argos began. He, you know, once those boards started closing down, John was like, "Well, you know, now now we can talk and." I can tell you about, you know, exactly what goes on. And, um, yeah, our, our, our adventure begins. Yeah, incredible story. And, and uh, you reveal so much, of course, in, in the documentary. Tell me about the challenges then that you faced in, in getting the police on board to, to be part of the filming and to actually create this documentary because, of course, you're dealing with such sensitive and difficult sort of issues in the first place. Um, how did you both work together to, uh, to fashion the documentary? Well, I think like the, the, the challenge, really, yeah, Deb will tell you. At the stage, I knew that this, this story was way too big 
for me. So I needed somebody with um, I needed somebody with um, yeah the basically the um, the storytelling and filmmaking experience to to help me tell that story. So I reached out to Simon, um, and I think um, I think you know very from that very first initial meeting. Um, I think the story, um, you know, moved Simon. Um, well, I mean, Simon can tell you in his own words. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I was shocked. I, you know, once Dev convinced me this was actually the scale and complexity that um, that he'd been told about and that we realised just, you know, I've been at this making documentaries for 30 years or more, Peter, now. Seems like forever. Um it was clearly the biggest story I had never heard of because it was just, it was just massive and no one even today actually really gets just how big it was in terms of the police. The funny thing was, and I've dealt with police before on different films and it, you know, it's always a bit of a, a compromise or a, at least a negotiation. I think Deb will agree. What we were surprised by was how willing they were talk about it because they were feeling overwhelmed by the scale of the problem and weren't getting the kind of public recognition for what was really going on. Um, the challenge for us was how do we tell the story? Because <laughs> as I've joked with Deb before, I've never had a I've never had a, a film that has so much gripping archive and we cannot use a single frame of it. I mean it's just you can never show the extent of what's really going on. But we still had to find a way of conveying the gravity of it and and in a way that wasn't just going to turn people off because it's such a kind of like, you know, it's such a confronting issue. I think pretty early on we decided, certainly after we got to know and have, you know, many meetings with Argos and the various, various layers of Argos from management to the undercover operatives to, you know, um, the beat cops, if you like, in the field, um, we realised that they were the story. I have been lucky enough to meet, you know, over a period of years, you know, pretty remarkable figures to be able to work with and film with, but I don't think I'd ever met a group of such remarkable people as the Argos investigators, particularly this unit within them, really, which is the victim ID team, the victim identification team, whose job is really not to find the criminals so much, but to find the children, the children in the pictures. And so we felt that if you could, as an audience, grasp onto those very heroic figures, those incredibly brave and, and courageous investigators, then there was a way to unfold both the history of this crime, because it's a technology crime and it's evolved with this history, and also the, um, the, way, uh, the way in which it reaches into different tentacles from you know these online dark web boards now to every child really being a potential victim because they've got the device in their hand that will allow these people to get access to them. So there's a big sweep of history. There's a big, there's lots of complexities in the crime. One above all else that stands out for me is the fact that for the victim, the child, the crime never goes away. And they will grow up knowing that these images of them continue to circulate around the internet forever effectively. And that is a terribly difficult thing to deal with. As one of the cops said to us once, listen, in homicide, you're too late. The victim's gone. In this crime, the victim just keeps getting re-victimized. And that's another, you know, that's just one part of what makes this crime so different. And that's so incredible. It, it's just so challenging and confronting. And I can imagine the, the psychological makeup of John and the others who are investigating these um, these horrendous events, um, they would have to be so strong and so uh, capable of uh, of not reacting and and taking so personal uh, so personally the impact that uh, this is happening on the children. Oh yeah, I mean they focus, don't they, Deb? They they always say it's about the children. They focus, and in fact, Argos really changed that that point of view by and large for police force around the world and set the example for it was it's about finding those kids. That's the most important thing you can do as a law enforcement officer. You find the predators almost certainly as a result of that in any case, or by and large you do. 
because you know this every one of these pictures is actually a crime scene photograph or film except it's a crime scene photograph taken by the criminal <laughs> and so if you find the kids you usually track back to the perpetrator but their focus is entirely on the children and that was a kind of radical thought until some years ago because it was all about you know pedo bust catch patch the bad guy be obsessive about that now of course they want to catch those people too but it's really about rescuing kids and the remarkable thing about argos in the sort of 10 years or so since they really focused on victim identification is you know there's paul griffiths in there the ex-manchester cop who is the sort of head of victim id at, at argos um we asked him how many children he saved in his career at argos and you know he's modest and he beat around the bush a bit and you know he said it's not just me and it and, it, and it's true and it's lots of other police forces around the world we co collaborate with and we're come on paul how many kids have you saved and he said, oh, well, about a thousand. That's, you know, you're talking to Oscar Schindler in that extent. This is a man that is, whose work has saved at more than a thousand children's lives. And that's, that's remarkable. I mean, you do not come across that kind of story every day of the week. Wow. That, that is quite incredible. <laughs> So tell me more about the filming, because, of course, you've had to use lots of pixelation and uh, uh, and so on because you can't really show <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the events that are happening and, and so on on film. But juggling that with, of course, the interviews um, and with the investigations that were going on and so on, that must have been an interesting juggle in terms of how you put together the documentary and what you included and what you excluded. Yeah, I guess like the mantra of this documentary is um, not whether we sh should tell this story. Of course we should. It's from such an important story. It's whether we could tell the story. So therein we had to find that balance between what our stories are and the forms that those stories would take. And it also comes down to, you know, a, a, a lot about... Um, the purpose of this documentary, our, our purpose of this documentary is to uh, raise, you know, awareness and um, let people know about this phenomenon that, you know, that's happening every day in their own backyards. But we needed to develop a, a filmmaking lexicon, in a way, um, strategies, visual strategies, or even how we edited interviews to not uh, make it... Um, just there for shock factor, but, you know, to, to, to tell the evolution of this crime type. So, um, you know, having, having those kind of um, parameters to work in, it, 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 it's a challenge of, of, of you know, of, of a high degree, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, tightrope walking there to get it right. But at the same time, um, in, in, in a way, it, it kind of made it easier for us when it um, came to focusing on what we did focus on, because there's there's um, I, I, I guess one of the one of the you know the the one of the quotes that come out from um, the documentary is that um, you know these people do the job that we don't have to do you know they're they're doing it on our behalf and they and they don't want you to see that material they don't want you to witness it it is too harrowing it is too horrific. so um you know we took that responsibility on ourselves as well like we don't want our audience to have to view that material but you had to know what that material is and that was the kind of the balancing act juggling that yeah i think one other thing peter we wanted to to kind of avoid some of the tropes was that you know we didn't want to turn this into a kind of netflix true crime series it it just it just doesn't sit well with that kind of that kind of approach yes there's a you know we hope a kind of intriguing true crime element to the film because we do go through the sort of 
the history of a um, you know investigation, complex investigation, and you get the twists and turns and the complexities they're up against. But to wrap it in all that kind of like, you know, now very very quickly cliched approach to telling a crime story didn't actually do justice to the gravity and the importance of the subject. So we kept it pretty pared back. We kept it pretty straight. There's not a lot of kind of trickiness in there. There's a there's a very subtle and and I think nicely, beautifully delivered score from um, Mick Harvey, ex Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Um, you know, it, but it doesn't shout at you. It doesn't tell you what to think or feel all the time. And likewise, we just wanted to give those that testimony, that two camera testimony from the people actually deal with this every day, the space for it to sink in. And I think our, our editor, Alex Archer, you know, left those sort of breathing points in where you just have a chance to hear and let, you know, let some of those comments resonate before we move on. So um, I think we just didn't want to turn it into um, a kind of, which you could very easily, a kind of tabloid approach to this subject. Um, we just think it deserved better than that and and needed to be told better than that. Sure. And in terms of, of rolling it out, I suppose this has a very strong educational function uh, attached to it, uh, especially for adults, I, uh, although I, I was contemplating whether you would actually show this to children so that they can be alerted and alarmed, but, uh, but that could be very problematic. But, but I can imagine that um, there is that educational function and by showing it in cinemas and then it'll be on SBS uh, next month, I suppose you're trying to educate an audience about the dangers that are out there. Absolutely, Peter. And, and you know, we're having a little battle with the, uh, the film censor at the moment, the classification board. Um, we've thought it's been given an MA15 plus rating um, and we're seeking a review of that on the basis that, that, that in schools that would exclude a lot of schools automatically, particularly faith-based schools. Um, it just, you know, they just don't go there. Uh, and secondly, it would actually stop older students watching the film in a supervised situation with, with their teachers because the education departments insist that anything that's MA15 has to have not only the principal himself signing off no, or herself, no other, um, no other teacher can do that, and every parent has to give a written approval. So it was just the friction. It, it could be in the school libraries. Uh, and we're not suggesting that this is for young kids. It definitely isn't. But we're working very closely with ATOM, the Australian Teachers of Media, um, specialists in child trauma at the Australian Childhood Foundation uh, and educationalists that have had a lot of experience in this kind of education. And there is a big section of the cur curriculum now on online safety. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the national curriculum, as it should be. Um, Dev calls it online hygiene. Um, mm. And so we, we, we do want to make it you know, it's, it's suitably supervised, available in for older kids. Now, the problem is, the sad thing is, is that for most of them, it's almost too late at that age. I mean, you know, 15 and above, it's the younger kids who are the ones that are actually, you know, at, um, at risk from this crime, more so than the older ones. And that's problematic. But as the police themselves say, this isn't a law enforcement issue. You cannot... You cannot arrest your way out of this problem. This is a whole of society problem, a challenge that's, you know, of a scale, of a me too scale. That's the bizarre, unbelievable thing about it. It is, it is of that size. There are, you know, 20% of girls, 8% of, of, of boys will experience um, sexual exploitation. Um, and now it's so easy for it to take place. You don't even have to meet the predator in person. It takes place on your phone. Terrible crimes are committed against children um, in what's called user-generated content where, you know, this happens in their own bedrooms to themselves because they're exploited and they're um, threatened and they're sexploited, as it's called. You know, they share a picture that's probably a little unwise, and once that happens, that predator has them in their, in their hands. So, you know, it's a big issue. The technology companies are complicit. They are not 
supportive of changes because they don't want to open this Pandora's box of admitting that this is happening on their platforms. Um, you know, it's easy to bash Facebook all the time. Facebook's actually interesting in this debate because they're both the biggest reporters of this crime because they do do a good job. And they're also the biggest facilitators of the crime because they're about to encrypt messenger. They're about to create a kind of kids um, Instagram, like corralling kids into one, one yard. I mean, that is just perfectly made for predators to enter. And of course, under COVID, this crime has exploded even more because kids have been locked at home, predators have been locked at home, and they've got nothing better to do but go looking for children, vulnerable children. And so it's a complex issue that we haven't been having a mature conversation about. And that, I guess, if the film can at least open the door to that discussion, then, um, and, you know, we're working on that, uh, then it's achieved something. But it still has to work as a film. You know, it, it, you know, it's great to have an issue, but if it doesn't work as a film, then we've kind of failed in our job as storytellers. Absolutely. Well, I really hope the uh, classification board um, uh, rethinks its, uh, its classification because I, I agree with you. There is, in, in many respects, there is nothing uh, that you reveal that uh, is too uh, disgusting or, or outlandish or anything like that. There's no images. There's no language. There's, um, you know, we work very closely with specialists on that again to try and get that balance right. I don't think you have to hype it up in that sense. No. You know, it's it's just, you know, beginning to understand what's going on without the detail uh, and also just how commonplace mm. this crime is, then I think um, we've done our job, I hope. Yes. You know, I, think, you know, I, you know, I also feel that, you know, a, a lot of people will um, <clears throat> will have a knee-jerk reaction of, of not wanting to know that these crimes are happening um part of the the reason why we're at this scale and this crime has grown in silence. But, you know, the, the, the horrific stuff and the shocking stuff, <clears throat> of course, the, the, you know, the sexual exploitation of children is, is, is you know, probably the, one of the worst crimes that can be committed against the most vulnerable in, in our society. But the thing that I believe is the most horrific and the most shocking is the scale and the ease of which it can now happen. Mm. And the fact, you know, one of the main takeaways that we want people to uh, walk away from the, the, the screening is that we're nowhere near the tipping point. We're not, we're not at, you know, we're not kind of at the top of the summit looking down saying, you know, here, it's, it's going to get a lot worse unless we do something now. So we want, we want the audience to, to understand that <clears throat> the, 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 cap, the, the, cap, the capability and the capacity for change lies within their hands. It is more than the law enforcement issue. The police can't arrest their way out of this. And what we need to do is we need to start thinking like our investigators and putting the rights of children above the rights of privacy. You know, when did, when did um, the right of private information trump basic human rights is, you know, one of the big kind of questions that we pose. Mm. So, you know, we want, um, we want our uh, audience to, you know, take that on board and also realise that you know, you go, it's going back to that question that you asked earlier. You know, how do our how do our police do this job? And one of our one of our investigators says it so eloquently: "You save one kid, and it makes it all worth it." Mm. And you know, these are the people that can do something about it. But Actually, what, Debbie quoted the Torah. He quoted the Torah: "You save one child, you save the world." That's that was how he responded to that question, and it's true. That's how they get through it. Well, wow. incredible stuff. And, of course, this is not just an Australian thing at all. This is international. Uh, and, and this documentary, of course, uh, um, The Children in the Pictures, is obviously something that should be seen internationally and hopefully it will be rolled out because there isn't much out there on this sort of topic. No, uh, 
I'll tell you one thing that amazed me of many of the things that have, you know, staggered me through this process, Peter, is um, amazingly, as far as we're aware, and I think we would know because all roads would lead to Argos one way or another, this is the only film in the world that has really approached this from the level of, of the, you know, the global sophistication of these networks and, and um, what it takes to take them down. Yes, there have been TV series about predators and catching predators, you know, but, but small beer, effectively, not these kind of organised global criminal networks that are so pervasive. I mean, we know at the moment that the, the police are across um, and on a dark web network with over two and a half million members. Two and a half million. That's what we're talking about here. And and the explosion onto, you know, the crossover onto these hand handheld devices that kids are having is, you know, that's feeding content into these networks. But it's also, you know, the Queensland police caught a guy a couple of years ago masquerading as Justin Bieber online. He's um he's a you know respected academic in his day job. He had 10,000 hours of abused children that he'd collected for himself. Um, you know, these, the, and these are not unusual. We're seeing arrests of senior IT officials, of, um, you know, judges, police, sadly, um, obviously teachers who have had the opportunity. Um, this is not the sort of lonely, hooded loser in his parents' basement. Mm -hmm. This is our colleagues. This is our neighbours. This is unfortunately too often our family, um, right. and that's that's the you know that's what we've got to be aware of. I would just I'll let Dev have the final word, but I would just make a point for your listeners to anyone listening who's confronted by this, who um, is triggered by this. Um, it sounds like a shameless plug, but it isn't in this case. If you need help or you want help, go to childreninthepictures.org. There are there are links there to, you know, specialists and places to go if you need, if you need some help on this, or if you want to help, um, because it's it is a very confronting issue. And what we've learned now is that you cannot talk to any kind of significant audience without someone in that audience having experienced aspects of this crime. And so that's really, that's really what <laughs> one of the cops says. You know, leading police official when he's even addressing police conferences this walks up to the dais and said there's one person i can be sure of only one person i can be sure of in this audience who isn't a perpetrator and that's me and he's talking to other police so you know that's that's the message we have to get out that without kind of you know scaring people to death because there are ways of dealing with it but we have to be aware we've got to break the silence on this this crime Okay. You know, I, I think that, <clears throat> that that point about you know who is it, who's the perpetrator, who's the bad guy, the answer is now it's it, it could be every, anyone. Um, one of the things that um, you know Simon say, it yeah it, it's it's not the it's not the guy in the Macintosh hanging out by the park or the loser in the in the um, in the bedroom, nor is it. Um, just now uh, a Western European crime. Now we're starting to find offenders that are technologically sophisticated in Southeast Asian countries where, you know, they're racking up huge numbers of, of victims and being able to have presence on dark web, on dark web forums, like Simon said, that can be in the, you know, the millions of members. But still, it's the tip of the iceberg now compared to this self-generated, self-produced material that children are making themselves. That's just flooding in like an avalanche and the police are really, really struggling to cope with that. And this is abuse that can often be happening when mum is doing the ironing right next door in the bedroom, you know, in, in the living room next to the... In next to the kids' bathroom, it's 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 frightening of how pervasive um, technology has, has made you know access to children um, in people's homes. Uh, but you know these are the things that um, 
you know, the, the, what, like we keep saying, the police can't arrest their way out of. This is where us as human beings, as a society, need to draw a line in the sand and, and say, you know, the, the rights of children are important and, you know, we have to have a, a good, long, robust debate about how telecoms and uh, app manufacturers and social media companies have structured themselves if we want this to, yeah, have a happy ending in, um, in, in the years to come. Okay, great words. Look, look, it's uh, it's been great talking to both of you. This is an incredible documentary, The Children in the Pictures, uh, on release uh, this month at uh, various screenings and on SBS in October. And uh, I wish you well with the film and uh, and certainly with the audiences uh, taking note um, of the situation uh, that uh, the documentary reveals. Uh, thank you so much, Dev and Simon, for talking with me. You're welcome. Thanks, Peter.